Another beautiful day in the digestive tract. Is that you over there, Peptococcus? It is indeed me, Lactobacillus. But I'm surrounded by freaking rice. He likes rice, this guy. Night and day with the rice. Did you hear the talk going on up there? I heard somebody say, don't touch that, it's covered in germs. It's freaking insulting. They talk about us like we're... Germs. Exactamundo, my rod-shaped friend. Freaking guy, he couldn't digest nothing without us. But he uses that Purell like it was going out of style. Ugh, I've known some very good microbes died from that Purell. We should get in his bloodstream and kill him, see? And then we can eat his whole body. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Somebody woke up on the wrong side of the bile duct this morning. I don't like being taken for granted, Peppy. Duly noted. Maybe you need a vacation. You got a place where you can go? I got some lactobacillus cousins who live... You know, they, uh... They're part of the flora, as it were, and, uh... You know, one of them... You know, those, uh, those lady places. A vagina. See, I don't like to say it, but yes. You should go. Change of scene. I wouldn't know what to pack. Maybe instead we listen to this radio show. And now they used some of his yeast for craft beers. Colin McEnroe. All right. <laughs> I'm going to miss those two microbes. Uh, and they're living their own lives. And here's the reality. I mean, from a certain point of view... Uh, when you re really start, undering, uh, start understanding what microbes are and how pervasive they are and where they are, you realize it's their world. We are just living in it, to use the old cliche. Uh, we're going to talk about that today with three different guests. Uh, Ed Young is with us. Um, oh, I just made my, uh, my thing do something terrible here. Um, Ed Young is with us. Uh, he is a science writer for The Atlantic and writes a blog, Not Exactly Rocket Science, for National Geographic. And he's the author of I Contain Multitu Multitudes. I always love, whoops, sorry. I don't know what's wrong with me today. <laughs> I contain multitudes. Uh, I always love a Walt Whitman title, The Microbes Within Us and a Grander View of Life. And joining us through the miracle of Skype is Jack Gilbert, professor of surgery and director uh, of the Home Microbiome Project at the University of Chicago. A little bit later, we'll talk to Anne Beclay, uh, a biologist and gardener uh, and co-author with David Montgomery of The Hidden Half of Nature, The Microbial Roots of Life and Health. So in some ways, you've heard this story over and over again. It's been a, a, a toxin, I mean a T-O-C-S-I-N kind of toxin that has been sounded uh, over the last five to ten years that um, that we spend way too much time trying to kill uh, organisms, uh, microbes, bacteria, whatever we, we, we want to call them, uh, inside us without quite understanding uh, that not all of them are bad uh, and that, in fact, probably we are setting ourselves up uh, for other kinds of disasters. Uh, we may even be sort of clearing the playing field for pathogens instead of, in fact, getting rid of the pathogens themselves. So you've heard that story many times, but I'm not sure that we've really kind of uh, ever fleshed it out for you uh, at the level of maybe the whole world micro population. So we're going to try to do that a little bit here today, give you some practical advice advice as well. Um, so um, first of all, I'm going to begin with Ed Young. Welcome to this conversation. Hi, thanks for having me. So um, one thing that I note that you reject is sort of that good microbes, bad microbes trope, right? It's not so much that microbes are good, are good or bad. It's more that they belong, some of them belong in certain places and not in others. Uh, if you move them around from one place to another, you heard those two microbes talking in the introduction. <laughs> if they can get out of that digestive tract and into the bloodstream, they're not going to be good microbes anymore. That's right. Um, I think we've had this long-standing view that microbes are our enemies, that they are germs that we need to destroy lest they cause disease. Um, and that's been replaced by this narrative of friendly microbes and good bacteria. And, and I feel that both of them are, are just as wrong, because as you hinted at at the start of the segment, um, it's, it's the microbes' world. They've been here for billions of years, and we are latecomers to the scene. And those that live in our bodies, our, our microbiome, are very important parts of our lives. They help to digest our food. They train our immune system. They do all sorts of important things for us. But I think it would be wrong to think of them as our allies. Um, our partnerships with them, like so many other partnerships in the natural world, are are often very, um, very uh, easily broken. And we need ways of of maintaining those good relationships. And so uh, we, we want to talk a little bit before we get into those relationships about just the marvels, the scientific marvels of what microbes can do, including it's almost 
reasonable to say that in some cases microbes build other kinds uh, of, of, of creatures that are not, not microbes. And maybe mm-hmm. the best example uh, that we can give you right now is the Hawaiian bobtail squid. So um, it, it, talk to us about this creature, Ed. Yeah, so it's a very adorable little animal. It lives off the uh, shallow waters of Hawaii, and it has glowing bacteria in its undersides. And these bacteria produce light that matches the moonlight that wells down on top of the squid, so that any predator that's looking at this animal from below can't make out its silhouette. The bacteria essentially render it invisible. And it's only one particular microbe that does this. It's a bacterium called Vibrio fisheri. And somehow, out of all the many microbes around the water, uh, in the water around the squid, it manages to pull this one um, species out. Uh, and this microbe then goes on this fantastic voyage through the squid's body. It goes down some tunnels, past some pores, into these um, light organs. And then when it gets there, it just it changes them very radically. It, it's almost like um, the explorers in science fiction novels terraforming a new planet. It changes the the shape and the structure of these organs and converts them into their mature form. So this squid, in many ways, only reaches its final state if it makes if it makes the acquaintance of its bacterial partners. And those microbes, far from causing disease or or threatening the squid's life, help it to become what it eventually is. So we also want to make it clear, and maybe this will help us kind of get rid of the good microbe, bad microbe, good germ, bad germ trope, Mm -hmm. Um, how complicated this can all be. And I think a good example from your book uh, is what happens with certain kinds of pine trees that are attacked by a certain kind of beetle. So these pine trees have the ability, in fact, to to, uh, secrete uh, a defense thing, a thing called terpene that will actually uh, help fight uh, things off. The Mm -hmm. The beetles have a bacterium in them that, in fact, will soak up or eat up or help get rid of or neutralize the terpene, but probably not enough to save the beetles from the terpene. But then what? explain what happens then. It turns out these bacteria aren't only in the beetles. Right. They're also, uh, they're also part of the trees as well. And the beetles seem to um, carry them from one tree to another. So whether the, um, whether the bacteria are a natural part of the tree's microbiome and, and, um, and are just sort of naturally detoxifying the poisons that the trees produce, or whether they are part of the, the beetles microbiome and allies for the beetles are, are, is unclear. Um, but again, you know, you could, you could see that relationship in so many different ways. You could see them as allies for the beetles, as enemies of the trees, or just as part of the environments of both individuals um, with effects that influence both of their lives. And I think that the latter is is more accurate. You know, all of us, whether we're talking about a beetle or a squid or a person, you, me, the listeners, um, we are all just habitats for microbes. We are entire worlds in our own right. So uh, let's add uh, Jack Gilbert to this conversation. One of the things that we know, obviously, is this is a pretty chaotic environment. And, and I mean, the pine trees are a great example. The pine trees have something to fight off the beetle. The beetle has a bacterium then that can fight off the thing that fights off the beetle. But then it turns out there's some of that bacteria also in the pine tree. So after a while, the pine tree is, in fact, secreting something that's feeding the bacterium that's in the pine, pine tree that isn't even really being all that helpful. It's, it gets chaotic. It gets messy. So y- you do want to be able to look at least at what's going on in a relatively controllable environment. So, um, Jack Gilbert, uh, one place that you could maybe do that would be an aquarium, right? Aquariums uh, maybe are are a little bit more able to control what goes in, what goes out. So what happened when you started to study uh, an aquarium? So, yeah, we we wanted to really understand aquariums for a very particular reason. Um, you know, as you say, the, the other environments are just too complex. When we, when we, for example, look in a forest or even if we look in your home, um, trying to understand how the bacteria on people's bodies get into the home and how the home bacteria get into people's bodies is very difficult. So we wanted a more controlled environment. And, you know, we've been using animals um, as model systems for exploring scientific investigations for you know a hundred years or more so this was a, a natural um, intermediary between animals in the laboratory and the natural world this is the the middle ground and so understanding how um, animals in a controlled environment such as a zoo or an aquarium um, where we can 
monitor all of their food intake. We can we know exactly what medicine they're receiving. We know how old they are, where they were born, everything about them. Um, that gives us a lot more power to investigate uh, these microbial dynamics, which are so complex. So one of the lessons that we seem to learn over and over in Ed's book and in your research is the cleaner and more sterile you try to make something. In, in fact, often, as I said at the beginning, sometimes you're actually sort of clearing the playing field uh, for, for pathogens that would have a much more competitive environment if it were a little bit more randomized, chaotic, and, and less uh, controlled. So it, what did you find? I mean, what did you find when you, you looked at the environment uh, microbially of dolphins? So the one thing that we did find was that when we when we try to reduce the amount of sterilization in the experience of these dolphins, and I, I should preset that by explaining what actually happens. You know, the the dolphins and and all of the animals in an in an aquarium, any kind of aquarium, are subject to the rules um, put down many years ago, which stipulate that they're not allowed to be exposed to any kind of um, fecal pollution or any pollution in the water uh, that, that, you know, that humans would find toxic. So we treat dolphins the same way as we, uh, and dolphins in the water they swim in, the same way as we treat our drinking water, with the same kind of very regulated control over the levels of, of disease-causing bacteria and chemicals and toxins, which makes sense, right? But, you know, these dolphins live um, in the wild in a microbially rich ocean. Um, and so what we think is that when we when we sterilize this water too much, when we clean it too much, it actually affects the kinds of um, experiences these dolphins get. And we believe that weakens their immune system uh, in, in a in a very basic study at the at the shed aquarium. We we took bacterial um, communities um, and kind of enriched them in the water by preventing some of the sterile sterilization techniques. And that actually improved the health of some of the animals. So we, we think that this, you know, there's a there's a correlation there, not a causation. But we think that this is a, um, a good test of the hygiene hypothesis. Right. I mean, I, we're going to, I think, maybe come back to this in the third segment. But, I mean, I'm sitting here in this unbelievably hermetic building, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that and where I never really feel particularly good. I work as little of my day here as possible. I go home where, you know, in the warm weather, the windows are open and fresh air is coming in. Um, and Ed Young, you were recently on the show. Fresh air, I hope there you covered how good fresh air actually is for you. Florence Nightingale and everybody else is not wrong about this. Fresh air, in all the ways that Jack was just suggesting, you know, fresh air is more microbially rich. And it's, it, it's going to, you know, sort of balance things out in a way artificial environments just can't. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Flor Florence Nightingale spoke about the importance of uh, opening windows and having ventilation for um, taking care of sick patients. And, um, it, you know, it's not just fresh air, it's, it's all the, the world around us. Um, you know, we live in these um, very sterile environments that we have made deliberately more sterile through the use of sanitizers and, and antibacterial everythings. Um, and we, we have disconnected ourselves from this rich microbial world, from mud, from animals, from soil, um, all these things that used to, to expose us to a, a thriving community of microbes that we relied upon, um, that helped to build and calibrate our immune systems. Um, we are losing that connection, and I think that might um, help to explain the rise of uh, things like allergies and inflammatory disease, many of these things that have become very common um, in the Western world over the last um, half century or so. Um, there's increasing evidence that um, uh, that some of that rise can be explained through um, a lack of exposure to diverse microbes from an early age. So, uh, uh, Jack Gilbert, um, you know, like a lot of people who grew up in the 50s and 60s, I was born in 1954. You know, I grew up in a world where our parents were constantly cautioning us about germs. Don't touch that. It's covered with germs. It has, uh, you're going to get germs all over you. And I'm pretty sure that my parents and all the other parents around me didn't understand how many, quote unquote, germs, how many microbes there just sort of were everywhere. There are microbes in clouds. We discovered on a recent show that we did that we, we 
we met an artist who has people essentially drink clouds uh, and condensed clouds in order to experience the the life forms that are up there. Microbes are absolutely everywhere. So, but one thing that I, I think might have been a dream back in the fifties and sixties is, oh, well, let's just get all of the germs, quote unquote, out of our environment. Let's get all the germs out of us and not have any germs. Do we know what happens when you do that? Haven't there been experiments uh, where they tried to create mice that essentially had no microbiome? Yeah, so I mean, this actually started in the 19th century. Uh, Louis Pasteur, who's the um, the great god of uh, of our field, he um, he really uh, made a, a preposition. He said, "I don't think animals could survive without their bacteria." Right, and this was this was back in the 1860s, um, and it wasn't really until the 1920s that someone was able to create a germ-free animal. Uh, funnily enough, the first germ-free animal was a guinea pig, I think. And so, um, and then that spread to rats and mice. And we were able to make them germ-free. You know, essentially, we give them a cesarean section and cut the uh, the newborn embryo um, or newborn fetus out of the mother and keep it under very sterile conditions. You do this a number of times, and you can create an animal which has no microbes associated with it. It does actually change the way the animal develops. From the outside, the animal looks... Well, ostensibly like uh, any kind of rat or mouse with a microbiome, but internally some of its organs are reshaped, um, some of its immune system can uh, function differently, even its brain and its behavior are completely affected. So we, we, we know that the microbes are important, they play a role in the development of the animal over its life, but um, we, we really didn't understand that at the time. And in fact, there was a big push uh, in, in the public um, understanding to, um, to uh, maybe make humans germ-free. Um, and there was a suggestion this could make you live longer. Um, obviously, that's not necessarily true. If I, if I took you right now and I removed all your microbes and then I sent you back out into the world, you would die very quickly. The bacteria in you process parts of your food. They give you nutrients. Um, they also protect you from other pathogens, from other disease-causing organisms. So we need them inside our body. They are one of our first lines of defense. So, yeah, the, you know, we can make an animal germ-free, but it's, it's not a condition you really want to see um, in any animal anywhere in the world, as long as there are microbes on this planet. So, Ed Young, to his point, we've become the kind uh, of uh, military force that will shoot its own army of 5,000 in order to get the 100 or so traders there. That, you know, the, the beneficial bacteria, the beneficial microbes far, far, far outnumber uh, the small group of species that are dangerous to us. But it, it I think the other thing that's happened has happened in our brains. I mean, we, we really do think that way, even if we know better. Like Betsy Kaplan, the producer of the show, and I both know better, but we both have those pump-style dispensers of Purell next to our desks. That we you know that message that has been around maybe, what, since Darwin? I, I don't know who got us started on this path. But our brains are started to wire themselves almost irrationally in favor of the eradication of microbial life. Yeah, we've had this long cultural baggage um, about microbes as threats. And I think it started um, right from the, the, the early days of people like Pasteur, the germ theorists who realized in quick succession that many of the most infamous plagues um, to, to affect humanity from actual plague to tuberculosis to cholera were all the work of microbes, of bacteria. Um, but if you go back further in time to um, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, the man who saw microbes for the first time, who realized that they exist, when he realized that his mouth was teeming with microbes, when he studied the bacteria in his dental plaque under his own microscopes, he wasn't repulsed at all. He was actually really excited and he thought they were quite cool. Um, it was only much later that um, that we, we came to associate them with disease. And I think that's a, a, a view that has stay till this day you know I, every every week every month i see headlines showing that um someone has swabbed a surface it, like a desk a phone a keyboard a wallet something like that and found bacteria on them <gasps> gasp um, and the the insinuation is always that those surfaces are dirty those um those bacteria are going to cause disease and in fact that is 
grossly unfair. The vast majority of them are uh, benign or they are beneficial. Like Jack said, they help us so much in our daily lives. They protect us from disease, they sculpt our bodies, they affect our behavior, they digest our food. All these things that we think of as the, the domains of individuals, of ourselves, are actually things that happen in conversation with these microbes that share our lives. So, and, and uh, Jack Gilbert, and I may not have this all exactly right, but my understanding is that this is starting to lead to maybe even a, a little bit of different thinking about how to avoid infections after surgery, that in fact, uh, in order to treat patients, we need to treat their microbes. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so for, for many years, we've been um, blaming surgeons uh, when uh, somebody got an infection during surgery. I mean, it's it's an easy thing to do. We we think even the surgeons themselves um, have uh, believed that they've contextually removed um, all microbes from the equation. They pump the, the patient full of antibiotics. They, they use sterile technique. They use a very clean environment. Um, but then somehow an uh, infection occurs, right? Um, let's say we remove a section of your colon to remove a cancerous um, area and we stitch it back together. Um, if an infection occurs at the area where the stitching happened, it can only have been the surgeon's fault. Maybe, maybe they introduced a bug. Maybe they weren't clean enough. Um, what we started to actually find is that the bacteria that are responsible for that infection come from within the person. And this, this is a... Uh, a paradigm which uh, which nobody had really conceived of before. Um, these are bacteria which were present in the person before they went into surgery. Now, ex now imagine it from a microbe's perspective what happens when we uh, when we cut into their environment. They, you know, they're living in the in the gut. That's their home. We cut into it. We suddenly flood that environment with oxygen. And most of these bacteria find oxygen to be very toxic. That it's it's a stressor. It causes them to die. Um, then we pump them full of antibiotics, right? And antibiotics kill off a lot of them and stress the ones that survive. Um, and then a final insult: when the when the surgeon comes in and stitches the uh, gut back together, um, the body starts to remove nutrients, food for those microbes. It removes it from the gut. This is a stress response, right? You know, when the body's under stress, it it sucks up as much nutrients as it can in order to uh, rebuild itself. But that causes the bacteria to starve. And that's like a final uh, straw that broke the microbes back. They, they then attack the body to try and get those nutrients back, right? They're, they're starving. They're hungry. They, they, they riot. And, um, and that causes an infection. So what we're doing is trying to see surgery from the microbes' perspective. And we've developed several new therapies where we add those nutrients back into the gut. Instead, instead of having them starve, we actually feed the microbes or at least make them think they're being fed. And by doing that, we stop them from becoming dangerous pathogens and hence prevent infections. And one thing that one misleading impression that I don't want to leave the listeners with is the notion that we never, ever want to kill certain microbes. Sometimes we do. And uh, Ed, one of the more bracing chapters in your book is called Microbes a la Carte. Uh, and it begins with a story I wish that I had never read uh, about a, a mosquito born illness that causes various things that we, we fall into the category of elephantiasis. I mean, just horrible scrotal inflammations and swellings of the uh, lymph glands. And it's just kind of this this awful thing. Um, and it, 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 it seemed initially as though this was being caused by nematodes, these little tiny worms. But then it turned out that the little tiny worms, as so often turns out to be the case in your book, had an assistant, uh, had somebody helping them. So maybe you could pick up the biological thread of the story from there. Yeah, the worms um, have a bacterium inside them called Wolbachia, which is incredibly common. Um, it's one of the most successful bacteria in the world. And in these worms, it seems to be essential. Um, so if you kill the worms, what happens is the bacteria get released. Um, they don't infect us, but they trigger an infl inflammatory reaction. And it's that dual inflammation to both the dying worms and the bacterium that causes many of the symptoms of these horrific diseases where um, groins and legs can swell 
swell to gigantic proportions and people can become seriously disabled. Um, but the bacteria also provide a vulnerability. So some scientists are looking for drugs that can kill those microbes, that can kill the bacteria, rather than drugs that tackle the worms directly. And in doing so, they also then kill the worms. And there are drugs that can do this, and they have allowed people to treat, to cure these diseases for the very first time. Uh, there are complications there. The drugs um, you know, need to be taken for many weeks at a time. They're not good for pregnant women or for children. But by looking for similar compounds, similar chemicals, we, we're, um, there's a good chance that we'll be able to find even better treatments uh, for these incredibly terrible diseases that affect millions, hundreds of millions of people um, around the world. Yes, yeah, such was the peculiar relationship between the little tiny worms, the nematodes, and the Wolbachia, that when you killed the nematodes, which seemed like a very desirable thing to do, considering how much trouble they were causing, they released all their Wolbachia. Uh, exactly, so and was, made things worse. Yeah, yeah, far worse. So, all right, so we've mentioned uh, lactobacillus in the vagina. We've mentioned scrotal inflammation. I think it's time to take a break and reassure our listeners that we won't be scaring them too much more, although we still might scare them a little bit. We're back. We're talking about uh, microbes and the microbiome. Ed Young is with us, science writer for The Atlantic, writes a blog, Not Exactly Rocket Science for National Geographic, and the author of, most pertinently, I Contain Multitudes, The Microbes Within Us, a grand, and a Grander View of Life. Jack Gilbert is with us, professor of surgery and director of the Home Microbiome Project at the University of Chicago. We're about to talk to uh, Anne B. Clay, a biologist and gardener and co-author with David Montgomery uh, of The Hidden Half of Nature, The Microbial Roots of Life and Health. But Ed Young, before we get to that, I don't know if you could hear it, but I just heard a promo uh, from uh, Kai Rizdahl mentioning the Zika virus. Ah, the Zika virus. Everybody talks about the Zika virus. We've got so many more other interesting things to talk about here. But the, but, but the back bacteria we were just talking about, Wolbachia, actually, even though it's a, a pretty scary, a bad thing in some instances, may have some kind of role to play in combating Zika. Do you want to just quickly mention that? Yeah, totally. Um, so some Australian scientists have been spending a long time trying to get Wolbachia into tiger mosquitoes, the ones that spread things like Zika, dengue fever, uh, yellow fever. And they're doing that because if Wolbachia gets into the mo those mosquitoes, it prevents them from spreading the viruses that cause those diseases. And Wolbachia is also very, very good at spreading through natural populations. So if you release a small number of these infected mosquitoes, they will be able to to, within a few generations, pass on Wolbachia through the entire wild population, which then becomes unable to transmit these important diseases. And it's not like the nematode situation where those bacteria are then harmful to us. They don't get into our bodies when the mosquitoes bite us, but they do turn, um, turn these blood-sucking insects from vectors of diseases into dead ends. And this might be actually a really um, promising way of controlling things like Zika. Another, we, another reason why we reject the good bacteria, back, bad bacteria dichotomy, it turns out that, that a bad bacteria can be good under other circumstances. All right, let's add N.B. Clay to this conversation. We're going to talk about some things that maybe you're a little bit more familiar with, just in the sense that people are starting to understand that it's not necessarily great not to have a biologically rich gut, uh, that you, uh, you need a diversity of microbes uh, and you want to feed the microbes inside you that are beneficial to you in a way not completely dissimilar to what uh, Jack Gilbert was talking about in the kind of post-surgery situation. So, Anne B. Clay, welcome to this conversation. Thank you. So, uh, let's go at this from, from your end, as it were, uh, and this has uh, to do with what we eat. Um, how does what we eat affect what's in our gut? Well, there's a huge connection there, and it, it's really pretty simple. Uh, everything that we send down the hatch that makes it through our stomach and small intestine. And uh, speaking of grand parts of the world, the colon, that is one big grand place if you are a microbe. Mm -hmm. That's where most of our microbiome lives. And so the foods that make it down to the colon are what 
they end up dining upon as well. And so that's where, depending on what we eat, we're either feeding or malnourishing uh, the microbiota that live in our colon. And so this is in part what is so problematic with the Western diet. Uh, we've probably, I'm sure, all heard about that. And it's, Western diet tends to be pretty heavy on meat, uh, pretty heavy on sugar and fat, and pretty low on unprocessed plant foods. And as it turns out, when we get uh, the unprocessed plant foods, your doctor might call this fiber, nutritionist might call it complex carbohydrates, but when we get those kind of foods all the way down to our colon, we're actually feeding our microbiome the kinds of things that it needs to churn out some pretty uh, medicinal compounds. And um, one of those, there's a, a group of compounds called short-chain fatty acids. One of those, called butyrate, turns out uh, to have all kinds of effects on us, um, one of them is that our, our colon cells, the cells lining the colon, are, are somewhat unique in that most of the other cells in our body are, get their energy from nutrients that are delivered in the blood. But our col these, these cells lining our colon uh, actually get somewhere, uh, somewhere around 70, 80% of their energy from this short-chain fatty acid called butyrate. So why, why does this matter? Because our colon is a busy, busy place. We've got stuff moving through there. We've got microbes that are doing their business with our business. And you want your, you want your colon to be functioning well because when those cells fall down on their job, that's when problems like colon cancer, colitis, various other things can, can crop up. So one specific example is... Um, when colon cells uh, sort of pull apart from one another, there's something called leaky gut that can develop. And with so much uh, immune tissue wrapped around the gut, when any of the contents leak out, it sort of sends the immune system into, you know, high alert, almost berserk type mode. And that's really what we don't want because then it sends up, it, it creates a storm of inflammation and that leads to all kinds of other problems. But you have uh, your microbiome churning out butyrate, you're very unlikely to get leaky gut, or if you do have that condition, it's probably going to improve. I totally don't want to get leaky gut. Uh, you, you, <laughs> you managed to give me a powerful disincentive. It didn't sound like a good idea to begin with. So, um, Ed Young, maybe we could just sort of chime in here and talk about um, the way my, the microbiome can even be connected, at least according to ex uh, experiments by a researcher named Jeff Gordon, to obesity. Tell us uh, about the, uh, we were talking about germ-free mice uh, before. Tell us about uh, mice and obesity. So a lot of just classic experiments showed that uh, if you look at the microbiomes of lean and obese individuals, whether you're talking about mice or people, you see these differences. And you can um, actually transfer some of the symptoms of obesity across by moving microbiomes from one individual to another. So if you take the, the gut microbes of an obese mouse and put them in a germ-free mouse, that uh, the recipient rodent will put on weight, uh, more so than if you loaded it with, say, the microbes of a lean mouse. And that's very exciting because it suggests, it shows that uh, these microbes aren't just going along for the ride. They're sort of grabbing the wheel as well. They're affecting how we pr process nutrients in our food. Um, now, can we actually manipulate that to uh, lose weight, to improve our health? I think it's going to be much more complicated than that. Um, uh, other experiments from Jeff's group have shown that um, you, can get, you, can, you can get animals to lose weight by uh, loading them with microbes from... Uh, lean individuals, but that only seems to work if they are eating um, a healthy diet. It sort of goes back to what Anne was talking about, about giving them a, a large range of fiber, of plant carbohydrates. Um, 
And I think it, what this tells us is that um, the, the microbiome does have this connection to obesity, but it's still unclear exactly how, what that connection is like, like which species are involved, uh, which types of communities are involved, and actually using that information to, to improve our health, to help people control their weight, is going to be a tough challenge, and one that it doesn't involve like easy magic bullet solutions. Um, you know, all the, all the old advice about eating healthily will still have to apply, even if we look at our health through this microbial lens. So, Jack Gilbert, um, Anne is talking about basically keeping good microbes. Uh, we promised we weren't going to use that uh, term, but keeping good mi- microbes in your gut happy so that, among other things, presumably they crowd out uh, other kinds of less desirable uh, creatures who, who might want to be living there. Um, is there? We did a whole show about in, in, uh, inflammation, this whole kind of theory that like all, all kinds of things uh, are basically caused by inflammation. Is there a connection between the microbiome and inflammation? Yeah, absolutely. There's a huge connection. So bear in mind the, the immune system in of itself actually you know, shepherds the microbiome. They, some of the antibodies we, we produce are actually designed to, to bind on to certain types of microbes, but not to target them for killing, uh, just to target them and, uh, and make sure they're there and keep them in the right place in the body. Um, especially in the in the gut, um, uh, but you know certain microbes can can cause inflammatory responses because they release certain types of chemicals um, uh, and or they produce certain types of chemicals which get into the body and uh, trigger an inflammatory response. So things like um, irritable bowel disorder or irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease, uh, we believe are caused by uh, bacteria stimulating an inflammatory response, causing the inflammation. Um, In fact, in our animal models, where we produce some of those germ-free animals that have no bacteria associated with them, we can't trigger that kind of inflammatory response. So those animals don't get IBD or IBS. Um, Now, it becomes more complicated that inflammation can go systemic. In fact, we've just started to show that um, if we have a animal that's um, got a, a systemic infection, sepsis, you know, so you know that's what you go to the ICU for, and it can kill many people. Where these bacteria get into your heart and your lungs and your liver, um, uh, you know, after a surgery or after uh, something's gone wrong, and it causes a systemic inflammatory response. The body's trying to kill off these bacteria. And in doing so, it can go rogue, it can become too inflamed, and the body can die because of its attempt to kill off these infections. What we've shown is that we can pump new, healthy, good bacteria, and I'm I'm going to use that term, I don't care, um, (laughs) into the gut of these animals, into their intestine, and stimulate a different kind of immune response, which triggers the body to attack those bacteria in the heart and the lungs and the liver and clear them out. Um, we, Imagine that we're yeah. actually able to uh, clear out a septic infection mm-hmm. in the heart, lungs and liver and maybe even in the brain by putting bacteria into the intestine. And so in this way, we can we can use inflammation against the bad bacteria um, using the good bacteria to trigger that inflammatory response. Um, we also did a whole show recently about sepsis. We do a lot of shows, apparently, about these kinds of really alarming things. But, um, uh, Anne B. Clay, uh, before we lose you, um, one of the things that you talk about is thinking about your gut as a garden. And this isn't just a poetic metaphor for you. You are an organic gardener. And there's a way in which the parallelism is real. One of the things commercial agriculture has tried to do, basically, is wipe out all kinds of stuff, you know, pests and funguses and all kinds of stuff, just by bombarding it with all every kind of, uh, you know, herbicide and pesticide uh, imaginable. Organic gardening kind of takes the opposite view. So how does that connect to the conversation we're having? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting connection, uh, but it's also very fundamental. It, it turns, you know, I think anyone who's grown a plant or anyone who's, who's ever talked to a farmer or gardener, you can see that cultivating the soil is key to having healthy plants and one of the things that's sort of very parallel to the human microbiome is what is going on in the soil microbiome. Uh, Jack and Ed have both talked about germ-free mice and how unhealthy they are and that is equally true uh, in the soil. One of the most classic experiments is sterilizing soil, growing plants in sterilized soil, unsterilized soil, introducing pathogens, 
and those plants growing in the sterilized soil die quickly and do or do very poorly. And so what this is telling us is that if we can figure out what the right things are to feed both the microbiota in our gut as well as the microbiota that live very, very uh, close to, on, and in the root systems of plants, we are basically uh, building a health plan, if you will, into, you know, a plant's body. We ourselves sort of have this onboard um, health plan, our microbiome, but it all depends on what we're feeding it because, you know, our micro, anything that gets down into our colon or anything that gets into the soil, there's a microbe that can break that down and they're going to churn out a metabolite from what they're eating one way or the other. Some of those metabolites, very, very beneficial, like the butyrate that I talked about. Other kinds of metabolites are not so beneficial. One in our, in our gut um, that we know is not beneficial is uh, bile, which is what helps to break fats down. If you end up eating a lot of fat, you can get bile delivered all the way down to your colon where, guess who gets a hold of it? Our microbiome. They produce compounds from the bile acids that are very, very irritating to our colon cells in the colon environment. And this leads to, you know, or can lead to problems like abnormal cell growth, which then can lead to cancer. Mm. So we've got to be really smart about um, the notion of a diet because what we're putting into, you know, what we're sending down the hatch and what we're adding into the soil is what a microbe is going to eat. Exactly. And, and B. Clay, I want to thank you very much uh, for your contribution to the show. It's fascinating stuff. Uh, and B. Clay uh, has been with us for this segment. She is the co-author of The Hidden Half of Nature, The Microbial Roots of Life and Health. Uh, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about your built environment. Uh, how do the microbes fare where you live and work? Just won't go away We're getting used to all of our potions Microbes Reprogrammed to survive Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me, Kyone Wolf. Greg Hill appeared in the intro. The part of Bill Curry was played by Jamie Lee Curtis. Check out our podcast on TuneIn, Stitcher, and iTunes. And now, back to Colin. All right, we're back to the microbiome. Uh, Ed Young, still with us, science writer for The Atlantic, writes a blog, uh, not exactly rocket science, for National Geographic, the author of I Contain Multitudes, The Microbes Within Us, and A Grander View of Life. Jack Gilbert with us, group leader at the Argonne National Laboratory and director of the Microbiome Center at the University of Chicago. Um, so, um, Ed Young, just to set up something that Jack's going to talk about, you know, we talk about the micro, our, our microbiome, and I think people maybe think, well, it's sort of what stays in your gut. But our microbiome's all over us, and whenever we go anywhere, we sort of transfer that to our environment. Can you say a little more about that? Yeah, um, we. I'm, I'm sitting here in this studio just constantly bleeding microbes into space. Um, all of us have this microbial aura um, that we eject out into the world. So yeah, we think of the microbiome as something that's, that's inside us, sure, and that, that is true. But it also connects us to the world around us. It, it, it's a part of ourselves that we extend into the wider world. And we are, we are picking up microbes all the time from the, whatever we touch, from the people we meet. Um, from the surfaces we brush past. So uh, it's coming to uh, CBS next fall it will be CSI Special Microbiome Unit starring Jack Gilbert uh, as a uh, microbiome detective. But, I mean, that's not entirely fanciful, right? It's possible that, that each of our microbiomes, Jack, ha has a, a signature that we might be leaving when we commit murder or do some other act of mayhem. 
Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, this is something that's already been covered on CSI. So back in around 2012, um, uh, some work that was originally published in 2011 was featured on CSI, where people looked at the bacterial signatures people left behind on their fingertips touching keyboards. Um, and so, you know, the, the criminal investigators were able to identify the individual who was touching the keyboard because of the bacteria they left behind. We you know, uh, even identical twins, when they're born, they're born sterile, and their responses, their interactions, as Ed was pointing out, with the environment shape their microbiome. So even if you're an identical twin, you're never going to have exactly the same interaction with the world. So your microbiome is going to be slightly different to your twin. Um, and this is this is important. And we're, we're actually working with the National Institutes of Justice to see if we can use this information, use this, uh, this unique microbial signature each individual person has to develop it as a new layer of trace evidence uh, in criminal investigations. I want to stress we're not there yet. The preliminary uh, findings we have are extremely compelling, but we're not nowhere near able to use this in a court of law. But um, we're getting close to being able to see this as a, a unique fingerprint that a burglar might leave behind in a home or that um, somebody might leave on a dead body um, after, you know, um, after causing a murder. So we are we're very confident that we can use it in that respect. Ed Young, if there's one lesson that we would take away from I Contain Multitudes, it's right there in the title that, you know, that more is better, diversity is better. Uh, you, you want a lot uh, of microbial stuff in your life rather than less microbial stuff. Uh, that The odds are in your favor uh, if you do that. So it'd be great to be able to just sort of I don't know, just roll some huge ball of microbes right into your life. And you could do that by getting a dog, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and actually, Jack has done this. Um, I, I've met Jack's dog, Captain Bo Digley. He's a wonderful little thing. And um, yeah, you can you um, the the home is is often a microbial desert. It's uh, lacking in bacteria. But uh, if you get an animal and dogs seem to be particularly good at this, um, they channel microbes from the wider world into the home. They, they expose the residents of that home to a wider diversity of microbes than they would otherwise have had. Um, and, and that might be good for us. It might be good for our health. Uh, it seems that cats are less good at this because who knows what cats do. Uh, cats are mysterious <laughs> creatures that we don't really understand. Cats could help us, but they won't. <laughs> but they won't. They decide not to. <laughs> it's a to. decision they've actively made. So, um, Jack Gilbert, the other possibility, let's say I don't want a dog or I already have a dog, it might make some sense to shoot a little tiny bazooka shell uh, of microbes in, into my living environment or my working environment. Um, how possible would such a thing be? Yeah, it's, it's very possible. What we're most interested in doing is seeing if we can re-engineer homes, maybe the walls, maybe your, uh, uh, the paint that you use or even the carpets to contain um, a, um, a healthy microbial flora. The problem is we don't understand what healthy is at the moment. We have some indication that, you know, more is better. But um, importantly, we don't want to introduce anything into a home which could be it could be dangerous and could, you know, 20 years down the line lead to some other complications. So um, we, we're working very closely with architectural firms, with uh, material designers and developers to try and see if we can design an environment where this could be useful. One good indication of that is when homes flood and the, the materials in those homes become uh, waterlogged and damaged, we see a massive increase in fungi growing. And those fungi can produce toxic spores, which can be very harmful for human health. We think we can impregnate walls and carpets with bacteria that would only become active when the material became moist and they would release chemicals that would inhibit the growth of those fungi. If that's true and if that works, then we would have a, an extremely compelling case to prevent um, the development of these dangerous mold outbreaks. Um, and that could have you know, far reaching consequences for human health indoors. Um, Ed Young, you're going to get the last word. We're almost out of time. But Jack's describing a kind of microbial affirmative action where you really kind of reach out and get the microbes you want. But we sort of do the opposite right now. I mean, we mentioned it at the top of the show, but I am sitting in this very enclosed environment uh, where the fresh air is not getting in. And we do know from from your uh, book and from by the studies done by Jessica Green uh, that that that's probably a mistake, that the outdoor air is full of all kinds of stuff that's much better for us. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we talked about the importance of ventilation, of exposing ourselves to the, the great microbial diaspora of the outside world. And I think it's just something that, uh, that we are starting to understand, that uh, microbes are 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 often good for us, um, that they are just part of our lives, that they are helpful parts of our bodies. Um, you know, if you look in the wider world, um, you can see many animals that have these incredible abilities if they partner with the right microbes. The, you know, insects, they become instantly resistant to insecticide. And I think we can use the same principles to improve our health. All right, I hear music telling me it's over. Mm-hmm. We've contained multitudes of information, ideally, within this conversation. Thanks so much to Ed Young, to Jack Gilbert, to Anne B. Clay, and especially to Betsy Kaplan, who's throwing away her Purell today. Throw away that. Throw away that sanitizer. It's not good for you. Bacteria. He's a micro hunter. Exploring the great unknown. He's a micro hunter. Yes, he is. Adding brand new branches to the tree of life, mighty different from our own. Hey, Lactobacillus, how about we go get a drink sometime? Just you and me. I don't know, Peptococcus. I just got out of a really acidic relationship. Come on, we'd make beautiful mucus together. Hey-oh, okay.